الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين أشراقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصار الدمع يجري يا الهي خذ بقلبي للرشاد اشراقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصار الدمع يجري يا إلهي خذ بقلبي للرشاد اشراقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصار الدمع يجري يا إلهي خذ بقلبي للرشادي في سكوني Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa salam. By show of hands, how many uh, people in the house today are non Muslims? Any non Muslims in? How you doing, sister? All right. By show of hands, how many uh, attended the. Uh, the conference yesterday. Okay, alhamdulillah. So like the brother said, <clears throat> I'll probably just give you the short version of my story of how I came to Islam. Basically, you know, by way of Allah's guidance. In the Quran, 
in many places, Allah establishes that whomever he chooses to guide, no one can lead astray. Whoever he chooses to lead astray, no one can guide. My journey to Islam came way before the music business. I grew up in New York City in a very harsh reality. I dealt with crime, violence, drug abuse, drug selling, all sorts of things that a lot of y'all brothers might have moved to this country and bear witness for the first time, or maybe you came from countries where you know this epidemic may have spread where you live. But the reality of it is, just by the show of hands of the one sister, alhamdulillah, inshallah, ta'ala, she might become our sister in Islam, but for all y'all that are Muslims, y'all already know. <clears throat> Like the brother said, to be born upon the truth is one of the most beautiful blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could ever bestow upon a person. For me, the last grade I completed was the eighth grade. I'm a predicate felon, meaning I was convicted of two major felonies. And in this society, I'm considered a failure. In this society that we're living in right now, I am considered a failure. But only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed me on a path of success, the path that leads to success. And some of you brothers out there, I can tell just by some of the looks, not being judgmental, but some of you brothers have, you know, you, you, you dealt with the consequences of this dunya. You know what it is, you know? And if you're young now and you're just being exposed to it, then you know what it is, you know? It's a facade. And the beautiful thing is when I accepted Islam, it came from being exposed to the good things in Islam, not the bad things, the good things, the good characteristics of the Muslim, the good manners of the Muslim, the good hospitality of the Muslim, the cleanliness of the Muslim, the simplicity of Islam, all of these good things collectively is what brought me into the fold of Islam. But since I've been a Muslim, I've noticed that there are other conditions that plague Islam, that plague the Muslim, that tarnishes the credibility of the Muslim, that puts out, you know, the media puts out false perceptions of the Muslim. And what happens with some of us, it puts us in a state of fear. Fear not meaning that you're walking around scared, but fear meaning that you're compromising your religion to fit in. You compromise in your image of a Muslim to look like those who disbelieve in Allah. You compromise in your religion to look like rappers on TV. You compromise in your religion to even try to be like the rappers on TV. And as y'all all know, you know, I was very successful in the music business. I sold over seven million records. I wrote over 52 top 10 hits. I achieve heights that a lot of people dream of, even in the music business today. But the beautiful thing is that Allah has guided me away from that darkness, that darkness that a lot of y'all assume is light, just because of these three minute and 40 second frames of a glorified lifestyle, you think this is what it is. And basically, by telling you about my upbringing, me coming out as a mainstream artist was the best way that I could show any positive aspect of myself. It was to show the respect that I have for women, to show a more soulful side of myself, when I really conducted myself in a whole different way that you wouldn't even imagine. Because y'all see Loom, I Need a Girl, part 10. I see this guy, every song, he just needs a girl. Like, when is he going to ever get a girl? Some of y'all might even thought I was like the wedding singer or something. But the reality of it is, your hardest rapper, your hardest rapper, the one that you're running around imitating, he's the one that's the ex-ballerina. He's the one that took knitting class in high school. He's the one that constantly had to give up his lunch money. So it's like, when I look at you um, young brothers out here that try to imitate these brothers who wouldn't bust a grape in a fruit fight, you understand? These guys, I mean, I'm, it's serious because the reality of it is they should be following you. They just killing 17 people in the song. You out there trying to do it. 
They sticking up and robbing with music in the background. You out there trying to actually do it. And then when you find yourself in one of those cells, thinking about the stupidity that landed you there, and realizing why you in the day room, for some of you brothers that have been in prison, realizing when you in the day room watching the TV and seeing this rapper still doing, talking about the stuff that you in there for. He's free. He drinking champagne, he doing everything he want to do. You twist it. Everything on your back say DOC, Department of Correction. TV screen, you and some brothers fighting over the stories on, the stories is on. I want to watch the stories or something. Somebody get up, turn the TV, the whole day room fighting. TV don't belong to none of y'all, belong to Department of Correction. And the funny thing about it is that when people get put in these positions, they start to realize how much they appreciate things. You know? But me becoming a Muslim, you know, I learned how much I didn't appreciate a lot of things that most of the youth around the world seem to appreciate. Y'all seem to appreciate success or what's supposed to be success. And it's like, it's just retarded because it's not a real success, man. You know, I'm your brother in Islam. I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you about, you know, everything was peaches and cream, it's not. The music business is a very nasty business. And what I wanna share with y'all today, basically I wanna show you how the cancer spreads in the music business. This is what y'all don't understand. I'm gonna break the whole game down to you real quick and then we're gonna get into some Q and A's. And the way I'm gonna establish this, this is gonna be beneficial not only to the brothers but to the sisters as well. Because a lot of y'all don't understand how the cancer spreads. First and foremost, everyone's paying attention to the front man. The guy that's on the screen doing the videos, the guy that's on the mic, this is where your attention is focused at. So it's almost obvious what sins he's committing to contribute to this business. It's obvious, he's the front man, right? But what about the guy that shoot the videos? You understand? He don't hang with Lil Wayne. He just shoot the videos. You know, this guy, he just shoots the videos. So basically, he feels like he lives this mild-mannered life. You know, I just shoot the videos. I go home. You know, I, I, I kiss my daughter. I, I, I do homework with my son. I, I'm not really involved with those guys. You know, I just shoot the videos. I don't even hang out with them. I don't go to none of the album release parties, none of that. I don't go to nothing. I just shoot the videos. But the reality of it is when his daughter, she grows up, she's 16, 17 years old, and she says, Daddy, I want to be in one of those videos. See how the cancer that made his way home? This guy that thought he was so exempt from the business. Now he has to deal with the fact that his 17-year-old daughter wants to be one of these, you know, shake your butt girls in the video. Then you gotta think about the person that does the marketing. You know, they went to school for marketing. They had intentions of landing some big job with a Fortune 500 company, but they don't make it. They make a job at the record business. So now you have this rapper who basically pumps poison. Everything he talks about is just negative. Everything is just an exploitation of the street. He's glorifying things that kids wanna follow. But he only had local success. Nobody really knew him out there in the world. Then this marketing person, they comes in and market this guy all around the world. Now the influence that he had in his small little community, he done influenced kids all the way in Saudi Arabia. And I saw this with my own two eyes. A dude in Jeddah, Arab dude, riding around in a Hummer, smoking weed, listening to Tupac. An Arab dude with an afro. I don't even know how he had an afro. <laughs> I don't know what he did to his hair to make it fluff up, but I mean, he went to the extreme of trying to have an afro. Subhanallah. 